My name is Tim. I'm a student in training here at Grace Point. It's my privilege to be kicking off um, a few weeks in the Psalms with Psalm 1. Um, why don't you join me in prayer as we ask for God's blessing on the preaching and hearing of his word. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you for you are the living and true God, and you have revealed yourself to us in Scripture, Scripture which teaches us what we are to believe concerning you and what duties you require of us. And we pray that as we hear your word, that it will be accompanied by faith, by the Holy Spirit. We pray that you'll stir up our affections to delight in you and your word more and more. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it's said that the average adult makes about 35,000 decisions every day. Some of these, well, are trivial. For example, do I, do I choose to wear black socks or blue socks today? Or choosing where to sit in church today? Well, some are more significant, right? Whether or not to go through that yellow light on the way to church. <laughs> or maybe more important decisions about work, about relationships about family. And if you think about it, all the decisions that you make throughout your life, they've led to where you are right now. They have some way or another influenced uh, who you are today. Indeed, your decisions will also influence where you are going into the future, what type of person you'll be and where you'll end up. And our passage today Psalm 1 teaches us that, well, if you boil everything down, all of our decisions down, there's, there's only two ways to live. In the end, there's only two destinies, two types of people. Simply speaking, the way of the righteous or the way of the wicked. And so today we have two headings, very simply, the way of the righteous in verses 1 to 3, and the way of the wicked in verses 4 to 6. Or to put it another way, we can also understand these two headings as the description of one who is a Christian and the description of one who is not a Christian. So come with me to the first heading, the way of the righteous, and it might be, might be helpful to follow um, the outline. Well, this psalm begins with the word blessed in verse 1. This is the idea of maybe happy or favored. It describes the favorable circumstances that this person will have. And well, what type of person does the psalmist describe as blessed? It is the person who separates themselves from sin. You can see that in our first subheading. The psalmist describes this in three similar ways. We just heard it being read. Blessed is the one, firstly, who does not walk in step with the wicked. Secondly, or stand in the way that sinners take. Thirdly, or sit in the company of mockers. This blessed one basically does not enjoy being in the company of these people, of these wicked people, of sinners, mockers. These are basically synonyms describing the same type of people. Well, we can kind of uh, explain each one. Right? The wicked people, they're kind of those who are constantly engaged in evil. Sinners, those are those who sin or have a pattern of sinning. Mockers, these are those who laugh or mock at people who believe in God or people who believe in uh, God's word. And it's often noted here that there's a progression. There's a progression from walking to standing to sitting. And that's usually the experience of falling into sin. Right? It, it, it usually doesn't go from zero to a hundred in one day. But it's a gradual progression, a gradual slide downward. One or two things here or there, one hour here and there, which spirals into a habit, a pattern of living, which finally makes us practically indistinguishable from the wicked, from mockers. Now, why is this so important? Why is this the first thing that the psalmist describes? It, it sounds kind of negative, doesn't it? And, and why does doing these things or not doing these things bring blessing or happiness or favor? Well, there's at least two reasons. Firstly, the righteous person, the Christian, 
knows the danger of associating with sin. We're so influenced by the people who we spend time with, aren't we? With our friends, with our family, with our colleagues, with those we hang out with um, after work. It's, it's just the fact that we become like those who we associate with. And we can sometimes underestimate this fact, can't we? We think we are independent people that I would choose what I want to do, no matter you know, if I'm with these people or those people. You know, I would choose what's best for me, and no matter what movies I watch, no matter what media I consume, no matter how I spend my time. And, well, that might be true at the beginning, but over time, your mind, your heart, your will, your goals, your desires, your faith will change. It will be influenced and you will inadvertently, by and by, become like those things, those people that you spend time with. The second reason is that the righteous person, the Christian, hates sin. The Christian hates sin. If you hate something, you'll avoid it, or you'll avoid anything related to that thing. You definitely don't actively seek it out. I hate cockroaches. I don't actively seek out cockroaches. Um, I hate seeing them. I hate thinking about them. And I do what any reasonable person does. Uh, well, sometimes I run away, but usually I'll, I'll, I'll kill, kill the cockroach. I'll kill them because I hate it so much. Well, it, it's a similar thing, isn't it, for us? Um, if we hate sin, though there's a difference here. If we hate sin, we will avoid it and we'll want to kill it. And I know that sin sometimes has some attraction to it. It can be tempting. But I think we should view sin as a cockroach. It's disgusting. We should avoid it. And if it comes to us, we should kill it. We should stomp on it. And so we see that the righteous person, he separates himself from sin. This is what leads to happiness, to being favored, to blessing. Because sin is what separates us from God. I wonder if we lament over our sin, as we heard last week. Do you lament over your sin? But do you not only lament over it, do you repent? Do you turn from your sin? Do we lament that we linger often in our sin and sinful influences? Now, there's, maybe you know there's things that are bad for you, that are sinful, that are not pleasing to God, but you don't separate yourself from it. You continue walking in step with it. You stand in its way. You sit in its company. But do you know that the danger of this, and we'll, and we'll see this as we come to our, our second main heading later, but we are, we are creatures of habit. If we've been indulging in sin and sinful influences for an extended period of time, it's, it's going to be hard to change that immediately. But the question is, do you want to change? Do you hate it? It may take time, it may take process, you may need support and help from others, but first and foremost, do you hate it? And secondly, do you want to change? Do you want to change? Then repent, turn to God, ask for his help by his spirit. God is the only one, ultimately, who can change you. And that we have to realize that God loves you, that God hates sin more than you do, and his desire is that you turn from your sin, that you flee from those sinful influences and your sinful habits. Do you believe that God is on your side and wants you to separate yourself from sin? And so we see that the Christian, the righteous person, is separated from sin. But being a Christian is not just not doing certain bad things. It's not just not sinning, um, though that is true. We also need to actively do things. We need to be saturated in scripture. And that brings us to our next subheading. Look at verse 2. Instead of lingering in sin, we see that this righteous person, this Christian, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and he meditates on it day and night. Here the law of the Lord is all of God's word. It is scripture. And for the psalmist, which I think is David, he would have only had part of the Old Testament. But we have the whole of the Old Testament and the New Testament. The righteous one, he delights in Scripture. He finds pleasure in it. That's his joy. And this is what characterizes him. 
Notice that he also has actions that follow. He saturates him, himself in Scripture by meditating on it day and night. And this is connected to verse 1. It's impossible for anyone to really apply himself to the meditation of God's Word, God's law, if he has not first separated himself from sin. If your mind is filled with sin, if you're always associating with sin and sinful influences, sinful things, you, you can't really be filled with God's Word. You won't be able to be saturated with Scripture. Jonathan Edwards, uh, 18th century guy, he, he described you know, religious affections in this way. He said, From a vigorous, affectionate, and fervent love to God will necessarily arise other religious affections. Hence, will arise an intense hatred and abhorrence of sin. And that makes sense. If we love God, we will necessarily hate sin. Hating sin and loving God go together. What we hate, we will avoid. What we love, we will think of and spend time with and move towards. That's, that's natural. And so this righteous one, this blessed one, this Christian, he loves scripture. He loves meditating on it. And you don't really need to force him to do it. This, this meditating, I just want to explain and clarify, is maybe not what we today think of when we hear the word meditating or meditation. Because what modern people think of and mean when they say meditation is, is the practice of you know, mindfulness, of being calm, of silent, of focusing on your own mind and body um, with the purpose of increasing con concentration, of relaxing or having a heightened mental state. But that's not what the Bible means when it talks about meditating or what the Christian means by meditating. Christian meditation is not focusing on ourselves, our surroundings, our circumstances so much. The content of Christian meditation, surprise, surprise, is primi primarily God and his word. It's scripture. And in fact, Christian meditation does not have to be calm or silent even. The original word here actually means muttering to yourself. It's repeating over and over to yourself. Meditating is saturating ourselves with Scripture. It's, it's turning God's Word over and over in our head. It's thinking about it over and over again. Now, if we love someone, as I mentioned before, we, we love talking to them. We love thinking about them. We love learning more about them, don't we? And that's, that's what meditation, Christian meditation is. It's thinking of and communing with God by His Word and spirit. And just to be clear, meditating, meditation for the Christian can be done with the Bible in front of you. And I think in our generation, probably that's going to be the most common way. It's not just sitting there with nothing and just I don't know, being silent. Right? We have such easy access to the Bible in the West. And I guess one downside or a benefit is that we don't need to memorize scripture in order to read it, um, which was the case in previous centuries, um, maybe even when the, well, definitely when the psalm was written. Right? The, 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 the word of God had to be taught and memorized um, for people to meditate on it. But we have the Bible written down for us and easy access. And so church, do you delight in God's word? Do you meditate on it? Maybe not even day and night, but do you meditate on it regularly? Uh, we may call that devotion. We may call that daily Bible reading and prayer. We may call that quiet time. The, the name doesn't really matter. The first question is, do we do it? Second question is, do we, if we don't, or we're not sure, do you love God? Do you love God? If your answer is yes, then, then the second question is, do you saturate yourself in Scripture? Why or why not? If our answer is no, then I say this to myself as well, then maybe we don't really love God as much as we think we do. We don't really love God as much as we think we do. And now I want to especially address uh, husbands and fathers at this point, because well, this is something that is close to me and, and something I think is very important. Right? Husbands and fathers, they're the head of the household. And the head of, particularly when it comes to spiritual matters. And so, 
If you're a husband, if you're a father, do you know the spiritual health? Do you know the spiritual habits of your family, of your wife, of your children? And do you guide them? Do you help them? Do you encourage them? Do you lead them? Do you set an example for them? And well, if you want a brief suggestion, I think it's a good habit to develop for families to read the Bible together, to pray together, even if it's just five minutes for a day. And well, maybe one more note on this matter is for young parents. Um, speaking from experience, it's especially hard for young mothers to have time to uh, spend time with God, to meditate on God's Word when they're caring for their children all day, all day long, um, and, and for future young parents. And I think, you know, I, I know, you know, husbands, you can be tired after coming home from a long day of work, but I just wonder if, if as an act of love, as leadership in your family, you can, sorry, You can volunteer. You can volunteer to take care of, of the baby for 15 minutes, half an hour, one hour, to, to let your... Sorry. To let your wife, you know, go outside for a walk, listen to the Bible, to pray, to meditate on God's Word. And I think especially those of us who are of an Asian background, we do well in making sure our children are well educated, well supported financially, well rounded, right? By that I mean they know how to play piano or violin or both. And that's great. That's wonderful. We, we should encourage our children to you know, do their homework every day, to practice their instruments uh, a few times a week or every day for good parents. But I'm speaking generally, I don't know, I don't know each of your family practices, uh, what you do at home. And so this may not apply to you, but I wonder, I just wonder if you agree that it'll be really good and beneficial for our children for our future children, if we put similar effort and encouragement into their spiritual habits and lives. We, 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 we are happy to take our children uh, to church, and that's great. But what about during the week? And maybe this is something you can discuss as a family. You could say something, well, you know, Tim mentioned this in the sermon. What, what do you think? What do you think about that? And so, well, we've seen that the righteous person, the Christian, he is someone who is separated from sin. He's someone who is saturated in Scripture. We also see that they are sustained for service. Look at verse 3. Psalm says, That person is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. This imagery, it's so beautiful, it's so wonderful. It reminds us of Eden. We see the stability, the growth, this, the prospering, the fruitfulness of the Christian. This is someone who is separated from sin, saturated in Scripture. And, and, this, and this makes sense because it is through God's Word and by the Holy Spirit that all spiritual growth and maturity is obtained. It's by putting to death our sins and living more and more to righteousness. That's sanctification. That's a healthy Christian. But I just want you to notice one more thing is that a tree doesn't plant itself. A tree does not choose where it goes. It is planted by someone. And it is God who plants us. 
It's God who has chosen us and placed us where we are with all the nutrients, with all the water that we need to grow. And, and that's ultimately the only reason why we can thrive. It's the only reason why we actually do separate ourselves from sin and saturate ourselves in Scripture. It's because God has saved us and continues to sustain us. He has plucked us out from the dry, weary, desolate wilderness of death, and He's put us in this lush, fertile garden, this land that has these streams of water. And, and, and this undergirds everything. And this fact is briefly mentioned in the first half of verse 6. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. That, that's the difference between the righteous and the wicked. And we'll talk more about that in a second. But as Christians, we are sustained by God every moment. And especially with regard to our spiritual lives. This is the foundation of all the blessing and happiness of the righteous one. That the Lord watches over him. That he knows you. And that's why we prosper. And so if we come back to this verse, we see that God has put us by these streams of water. Maybe you're asking, well, what are these streams of water? These are particularly things that help us to grow spiritually. God's word, prayer, singing, Christian fellowship, the sacraments, preaching. And finally, what is the result? We yield fruit. We do not wither. Everything that we do prospers. This is the way that God has set for the Christian. He's not just saved you and left you there, but He's made you and set you for this path of prospering. And this prospering, it's not financial, it's not monetary or worldly. It's, it's primarily spiritual, though there are other benefits that may accompany that. He will prosper you because, because everything, everything has God's blessing upon it. Everything that we do, since God has blessed it, it will tend to our own good, it will tend to the good of others, and it will tend to his own glory. And this is not out of our own merit. It's not really our own hard work, but it's because of God's grace in saving and sustaining us. The God who saves us does not leave us to fend for himself, but continues lavishing his grace upon us so that we become more and more like Christ. We prosper because we have been united with Christ and we have the Holy Spirit in us. And, well, one thing more before we finish with the first main heading is that I've so far uh, identified this righteous person with the Christian. Um, I've said they're, they're the same thing, they're the same person. And maybe this deserves some explanation this is the common way that Scripture refers to the Christian as righteous. And we know that before God, we are either righteous or we're wicked. There's only two ways to live. And there's no third option. The Christian is righteous, especially before God, because of his behavior, the, the motivation, what he does, how he lives. The heart of the Christian is different to the heart of the non-Christian. The Christian's goal and desire is to love God and be obedient to Him in all things, doing what is right, right, doing what is right according to God. And that's what this psalm primarily highlights, that this person, this blessed one, this righteous one, he does what is right. He loves God and he uh, delights in God. The difference is, is that the wicked does not do these things. And now, maybe I've confused you even more. Maybe some of you are even thinking that, well, aren't we only righteous because of justification? Aren't we only righteous because of justification by faith in Jesus Christ? And you're right. 100% correct. Full marks. We are only righteous because of justification by faith in Jesus Christ. And that is a really, really, really important and precious truth the forgiveness of sins, and the imputation of Christ's righteousness to the Christian. But we can't let that overshadow the equally precious and important truth of sanctification. Because of our justification and union with Christ, we are righteous and we can live righteously. We are able not to sin. Not only has our standing and our status before God changed, but our heart has been changed for righteousness. 
And now one more thing is that we, we should not think of this person in uh, verses 1 to 3 as a hermit, as a monk, as someone who just locks himself in his room and reads the Bible alone all day. Right? That would be a big misunderstanding of Scripture and of this psalm specifically. Because we see here that they bear fruit. They do good. Their private life and devotion leads to benefit for others. And as Christians, we are sustained for service, service to God, service to others. Our prospering, our bearing fruit is because God has set us on this path of flourishing. As we uh, know in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, it says that God, he who began a good work in you, will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. This is why the Christian should be the most joyful, most helpful, most loving, most useful person and people. And so, well, if you are a Christian, does verse 3 describe you? Is this how you describe yourself? Do you know something of God's goodness and blessing to you so that you can serve Him and serve others? That He has sustained us for this fact, not only saved us, but He continues to preserve us. Now, the wonderful thing about being a Christian is that we know that we have a purpose. We know we have a purpose. But not only do we know that we have a purpose, we know that our purpose will succeed, that we will prosper, that we will flourish, because the Lord watches over us and sustains us. And well, we come to the end of our first main heading. And this psalm could very well end at verse 3, and it would be a great psalm, but it continues. The psalmist turns his attention to the wicked. He contrasts the righteous person with the wicked. And so come with me to our second major heading, the way of the wicked in verses 4 to 6. Well, verse 4 begins quite suddenly, quite abruptly. The righteous, we, we just learnt, they're sustained, they're steadfast, they're stable, they're like a tree. But look at verse 4. Psalm says, not so the wicked, not so the wicked. They're like chaff that the wind blows away. Now, maybe some of you don't know what chaff is. Um, I, I wouldn't know if I didn't read the Bible. Uh, this, this imagery is probably not something that's familiar with most of us, um, but it would have been understood when this psalm was written. So let me try to explain it briefly. Well, if you're a farmer, after you harvest wheat, uh, the process of winnowing is used to separate grain from the chaff. The, the wheat mixture is tossed into the air and the wind blows it. And, and the chaff being lighter blows away while the heavier grain falls down and you can collect it and you can uh, do stuff with it. Um, and, and this gets rid of this you know, useless, this inedible part, the chaff, while leaving the useful grain. And so uh, in, in, in the outline, I've, I've used a different uh, analogy uh, that we're dispersed like dust. Maybe that's more familiar uh, for us. Uh, that you know, if you imagine on a windy day or if you have a very old book that you haven't read um, that you bought a long time ago, it's, it's dusty. And well, if you blow on it, the dust just goes away. And well, the picture here is that just as dust is easily scattered and dispersed even by the slightest breeze, leaving no trace behind, so too are the wicked. They are easily swept away, forgotten, having no lasting impact or stability. And this, this contrast, as we said before, to the stability of a tree, of, of this tree by streams of water producing fruit. And we know that the Bible often contrasts the righteous and the wicked using uh, trees, using a tree that bears good fruit and a tree that bears bad fruit. But here the psalmist does not use that image. And he emphasizes a different point. It, it, it's true that the wicked bear bad fruit, but it's not only that. It's that they're like chaff or they're like dust. They will pass away. They'll be blown to nothing. They'll be useless. One minute they're there, the next it's gone. And that's what the wicked is like. And you know, it may not always seem like that. Sometimes it seems like the wicked are prospering. It seems like they are stable, that they will endure to the end. But we learn from this psalm that that's only an appearance. The reality is that they will be dispersed like dust. 
It'll be insignificant, temporary, vain. You blow it and it's gone. And that brings us to our next verse, because we see that because this is their true state, that they are just like dust, because they have no stability, no future, no value, no righteousness, the wicked will be delivered unto death. Come with me to verse 5. The psalmist says, Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. Chaff is blown away. Dust is blown away. It just disappears. And, well, for chaff, sometimes they even burnt it because it, it had no use. They just needed to dispose of it as quickly and easily as possible. In a sense, it just took up space, just like dust. And so in the final judgment, when every person comes before the Creator God, the wicked will have nothing to show. How have they used their life that God has given them? What have they done that is of value? How have they kept God's law? Have they delighted in God? Have they loved God? And at this time, the wicked will have no defense. They will be found guilty of sinning against God with the result being death. And this is in contrast, which is even uh, mentioned in this verse. This is in contrast to the righteous who will be able to stand in the judgment. The wicked will not be able to join them. Here they're described also as sinners. The judgment here will be the final separation between the righteous and the wicked. The metaphorical wind of judgment will blow the wicked away while the righteous will remain standing. The Bible teaches us that there will be a final judgment. Everyone will be judged according to what he or she has done. But ultimately, what is the difference between the righteous and the wicked? Come finally to verse 6. It says, For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to destruction. This is the conclusion of this psalm. We see that the wicked are destined for destruction because of the way that they live. Simply speaking, we can say that there's two paths, there's two ways that we can go on. As I mentioned at the very beginning, the way of the righteous leads to life and prosperity, but the way of the wicked leads to death and destruction. These are the only two options for each of us. We're either heading down the road that leads to death, or we're walking on the road that leads to life. Jesus taught this much in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 7, verses 13 to 14. He said, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. Now note in this psalm, the Lord watches over the way of the righteous. You see, the wicked end up in destruction because of their own doing. This is their own choice. This is the consequence of their actions, the consequence of their sins. The wages of sin is death. They deserve death because of how they live because of the path that they are following, because of their wickedness. And that their punishment is deserved. But for the righteous, the reason why they do not end up in destruction is because the Lord watches over them. He saves them and sustains them to the end. This, in a nutshell, is the gospel. None of us are righteous in and of ourselves. None of us live up to God's holy standards to merit eternal life. In fact, all of us deserve death and destruction because of our sins. The only man that really lives up perfectly to the verse three verses of this psalm is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the only sinless man, the one who completely separated himself from sin, though he spent a lot of time with sinners. He's the only man who was completely saturated with scripture. And he's the only man who lived his earthly life fully sustained by God the Father and the Holy Spirit for service to God and to others. He sets the perfect example for us in this. And it is because of God's love in sending us His Son to die for us, that though we are sinful, though we are wicked, though we deserve death, though we, in a sense, were destined for destruction, if we believe in Jesus, our sins are forgiven. We are washed clean. His righteousness is given to us so that 
we have Christ's righteousness so that we can be called righteous. And our heart of stone is replaced by a heart of flesh so that we can pursue righteousness by the Holy Spirit. And so that we can and do separate ourselves from sin. We no longer pursue the lusts of the flesh. We no longer take delight in sin, but we hate it. And instead, we delight in God's word. We saturate ourselves in scripture and we follow Christ's example of being sustained for service. And so let me finish with three uh, points to ponder, three things to think about, three things to take home. Firstly, I, I just really want to address the younger people here, those who are in high school, uh, even, even in uni. I, I don't know especially what it's like growing up in high school, in uni these days, but I do know in many ways it's much harder than when I was growing up and when your parents were growing up. Like the pressures from media, from social media, from your friends, there's so much more than before. And you're expected to just go with the flow, not, not question the, the narrative, the thinking that is out there, the secular, atheistic ideologies, uh, the narratives of what love, of what fulfillment, of what tolerance is. But remember, uh, the way of the world leads to destruction. Your, your non-Christian friends, they may seem happy. They may seem like they're having the time of their lives, but this will not last. It will be like dust in the wind, here for now, but gone the next moment. So I want to encourage you all, keep coming to church, keep learning from Scripture, keep learning from God, from, from your fellow brothers and sisters here, and you will prosper. You will have a true, lasting joy and happiness as you enjoy and delight in God and His Word, who saves and sustains you. Now, the second point to ponder is, well, I wonder how is your current enjoyment of God and His Word? Do you delight in His Word and meditate on it day and night? And well, maybe more practically, how can we be cultivating that for ourselves, for those we have authority over? I, I can't emphasize how important spiritual habits are. And this delight, this delight, it may not, it may not come instantly. It may have to be cultivated. It may not even be constant all the time. But if you are a Christian, we must be delighting ourselves in God and His Word. We must be saturating ourselves in Scripture. And, that, and that's how we will know God better and be able to delight in Him more and more. Thirdly, do you believe that there are only two ways to live? That one leads to life, prosperity, the other one leads to death and destruction. If you're not a Christian or if you're not sure, then take hold of Christ today. We have seen that Christ is the only one who is truly righteous. He has given his life for all those who believe in him. He was sent for sinners like you and like me. Now, if you are a Christian, this should stir us up to care more about the souls of others, shouldn't it? Without Christ, the world is on the, uh, on the road to destruction. They're destined to death and destruction. And so, friends, which way, which path are your decisions every day taking you? We make 35,000 decisions every day. Are they leading us to the way of the righteous? Or are they leading us on the way of the wicked? Choose life and live. And you will delight in God and His Word, not only in this life, but into the next and to all eternity. We will spend all eternity meditating on God and His Word day and night in the presence of the triune God. What a blessed thought. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you that you have saved us, that you sustain us, that you have given us your Son, that we have his righteousness by faith, that we have the Holy Spirit who has changed our heart to pursue righteousness. 
And so we pray that you will help us, that you'll continue to sustain us as we partake of the means of grace, that we'll grow spiritually in our love for you, in our delight for you and your word, and for our love for others. And that these truths will be so real to us that it will stir us up to uh, care more about those in our uh, immediate uh, family, for for those who we have authority over, because there are only two ways to live. One leads to life, and the other leads to death. So we thank you for your presence with us this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.